It's a high tech conversation on the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Welcome everybody to Bench Talk 101 this week. Um, we, we've got a fascinating talk uh, in front of us, but um, I just thought uh, it, you know it's, it's it's right to mention that um, you know two weeks ago we we had a fantastic talk about the history of Diston, um, and uh, unfortunately Mark had some uh, horrific news, um, completely out of the blue, when his his wife of uh, seventeen years. Um, completely unexpectedly passed away in, in the night. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's such a shame, you know, Yvonne was only 53 um, and, and it just shows that, you know, it can hit any of us at any time. But I think really at the moment, our sympathies really, you know, go out for Mark um, and, and our prayers and thoughts are, are with you, Mark, if you're watching this at um, a, a later date. Um, you know, this is tough times and, uh, you know, we're, we're all there, uh, you know, if we can do anything for you, um, you know, we'll, we'll be there for you. Um, I think that this is really becoming um, a little bit like a, a family um, uh, of people here where, you know, we're starting to, to look out for one another and, uh, you know, these things can, can sort of help. So please reach out to any of us if, if you need any help in the future. So um, it, it's really interesting, the Bench Talk uh, 101, how we've uh, gone from, from just starting one week and, and then, you know, week on week getting bigger and bigger um, and, uh, you know, more interesting, um, uh, you know, approaches of different dynamics of, of how we can take this forward. Um, so it, it's been really sort of um, brilliant to hear a lot of your ideas about how we can take this forward. And, and, and of course, we'll, we'll share a lot of those with you over the, over the coming weeks of what's going to happen. It's, it's really quite, quite exciting stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, today we've got uh, a chap called um, Chester Spear, um, who, who's going to give us a, a talk. Okay. Um, and um, what, what's really interesting here, Chester's been here um, almost from the start. I think he missed the first episode, but, but from the rest of them, he's been on every single episode. And, and Chester's always the first to uh, put his hand forward um, and ask a question um, and, and sort of, you know, really, um, you know, know and understand the, the history around the tools um, or, or the different makers, which is really fascinating. But every time he's been on, he's been in a, a different room in his place or, or he's been, um, you know, in front of a different tool. Um, and it's quite fascinating. And, and, and sort of the more we get to know people on here, um, you know, the more fascinating it is that, you know, we're a bunch of completely random people, um, all from different backgrounds that are coming together to, to talk about our passion. So um, Chester um, is uh, retired actually now, but he's from the film and, and television industry, um, and he was a, he was an art director and prop master and set designer. Um, so he's been involved in um, you know lots of uh, um, sets of, of the films, um, you know supplying the actors with the um, with the props and the different things that they need, um, and the sort of range of the the props could be anything from daggers and knives to um, telephones or all, all, all over the things. So kind of his um, his collection has has grown massively, um, which we're going to get to see a bit today. But you know some of the films that he's worked on over the forty years, um, films including like uh, the Silver Bullet. Cat's Eyes, Sleeping with the Enemy, um, Crimes of the Heart, Maximum Overdrive, just to name a few. Um, I, I have got a massive list here, but yeah, I'll let Chester talk to you about those. So, um, less from me, what I suggest that you do is that you turn your views now to, um, to, to speak of you so that you can see Chester in his full glory and his absolutely amazing workshop. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be... Um, uh, you know, really interesting to hear Chester and, and his story about his life, but also about his collection he's got there. So Chester, over to you. So uh, I'm assuming you can hear me. We can hear you, yes, yeah. Okay, great. How is everybody today? I'm, I'm awfully sorry about that news. And uh, I sent out a, a note to him, but we'll see what happens. Um, so I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about me. Um, of course, you all know that I'm over in the States. Um, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, up in the mountains. But I'm originally from New York. I was actually born in Manhattan, but don't hold that against me. Um, what what uh, I thought I'd mention is uh, a little bit of my background. Uh, to start with, um, I was the youngest of six kids, and uh, we were all children of two artists. My mother was a dress designer and costumer, and she used to make these big banners for the front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, 
And so she was very talented. And my father was a sculptor and a writer and a photographer and a printer and a woodworker. And we grew up in a big house in New York that had a ceramic shop and a jewelry, jewelry shop and a, a, a print shop with two or three printing presses, a room full of veneers that my father had uh, um, salvaged from a, a job that he was working at uh, making plywood. And so I still have some of that rosewood veneer uh, hanging about and I still have a lot of Cuban mahogany from the uh, early 50s. But um, so uh, growing up in a house like that, there was a lot of things that we did in the house that I thought everybody else did. We loaded our own sheet film for our four by five cameras and um, uh, had to, we bought film in bulk, 35 millimeter, and we had a closet that was de designated for, uh, dedicated to loading film into the little capsule. And so um, uh, touching on that, I brought some things for you to look at just so you could see um, my father did woodworking. My grandfather's brother was a great carver. He was actually an anthropologist, but he did carving. And my, on my mother's side of the family, I'll show you some things later that uh, they did as well, woodworking. But I thought I'd show you, this was my first mallet that my father actually made me out of dogwood when I got my first set of chisels. And he made it for his hand, obviously. And uh, even later as an adult, I made my own a lot smaller. And these were some of his pieces that I inherited. This was his uh, sharpening stone. And um, he made this little box for the fine and, uh, and coarse. And um, another one for this one. And when he was a child, he made this for his mother in Rosewood. These were his mother's uh, initials. But so we were always surrounded by that sort of thing. I made my first table, which you'll see in a little bit, when I was seven. And then uh, uh, a, I had already started making boat models before that. And then as far as the, uh, I got into theater eventually, and I, then I got into film. So I, I brought out some props that I had to make for different shows and things. Um, one is a walnut gavel for the judge on Matlock. And these were uh, murder weapons and they're foam rubber. And so I had took a regular wrench and cast it and then, uh, this one is foam rubber with a piece of balsa in the inside so you could swing it without it just doing that. One looks a little more real than the other. And the same thing with switchblades and uh, other murder weapons. So my house, if I were to die and somebody come in and search it for some reason, they're not going to know what to think. Um, this was, um, this was a, uh, a letter opener, which was a murder weapon in one of the shows. And it was made so that you could unscrew the handle. Um, and then you just um, would take the handle. And I did a little, this was one of my first chip carving jobs. You just do that. And then you would add it to this. And then this would go on the person's body. And, uh, and so that would be them after they've been stabbed and laying there. So this is my shop. Welcome to my shop. Um, we're gonna walk around because we're gonna go from my shop into the tool room, um, which could be considered a hoarder's paradise, but it is organized. So that's one little benefit. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of things in here. Um, in particular, this is where I usually work the most. And of course the table saw and my built-in router table and one of the lathes and the cutoff section. But this was a bench that I designed to look like an old fashioned bench with a well for the tools, although it's on the front. But the nice trick about it is that it's not a full thick piece. You can lift this, and I don't know if you can see, but uh, this is where I keep all of my extraneous hardware. And then uh, the only problem is if you're doing something on this bench and you need this bolt, then um, if you'll pardon the expression, you're screwed. So, um, but it just folds back down and you can use it as a bench. And, um, and here I keep a few spills and, and what my rasps that I use the most, my bench cleaning tools. And uh, this is my, uh, my storage for my uh, rasps and files so they don't touch each other, but they're easily accessible to the bench because usually when I need them, I don't want to have to go in the tool room to get them. Whereas all my planes and everything that I'm really worried about rusting a lot are all in the tool room. So um, moving forward, 
um, you see that every little square inch is kind of taken up. My levels are here, my hammers are up there. I'll show you those later. But um, that's um, because even though I have a lot more room than say uh, Trenick with his little shop, the, it, it's still too much. So I, I have to really organize things. I wanted to show you this plane here. This is a typical Stanley corrugated plane. And somebody was uh, throwing this away and I grabbed it because, um, not because it was a good plane to use or anything, but because I think it was a great example of what happens to one of these planes if it's ever caught in a fire. And um, I don't know if you can see here, um, I'll hold it up. Maybe you can see down the end of it, but it is actually just totally twisted. And if you put it on a flat surface, um, you can see, I think I still smell smoke from that from I don't know how many years ago. So this is the bench that I'm usually at, and I keep these two vices here. This is just a triangular vise with a wedge, and uh, it works great for small pieces. And then, of course, the uh, pattern maker's vise um, for some of the, of the longer work. And I, it tilts up, or it will pivot, or you can turn it completely upside down, and there's a machinist vise on the bottom of it. A very handy tool. So for Jim, I laid out these planes here. Now, I took them out of the tool room, so there'll be empty spots in there. But I took these out because Jim suggested the name of this uh, video should be, um, uh, that's another fine mess you've gotten me into, Stanley. And uh, then accused me of not getting the joke. So, and he was probably right. I was just, um, I was just nervous, I guess. So I laid out some Stanley planes to show you guys, and uh, this is not the whole series of sizes of the Bailey design uh, plane, uh, but it, it, they were, Bailey's planes were made by Stanley, but designed by Bailey, um, and, and due to a lawsuit, he got his name back on the planes. But this is a number one, a number two, a number three, a four, a four and a half, a five and a quarter, which is a student's plane. It's a little thinner than the uh than the five and then uh and then a number six and then i skipped the number seven oh, this is a five and a half i'm sorry i skipped the number six and the and the seven because it would be a little redundant but i did bring out the number eight which is one of my favorites an early one with a low knob and i replaced the blade with the lee nielsen blade and you can tell if these you were here you could see the difference in thickness and and uh this plane works so beautifully with the Lee Nielsen cutter that um, there's no chatter and um, you can see the beautiful ribbon that it makes. So that's my homage to Jim and Stanley. So let's go over here and um, show you this corner of the shop. Um, this is where I keep most of my uh, uh, clamps the smaller G clamps and C clamps. I have another room back there which we won't get to that has all my bar clamps. <coughs> That's my panel soft or plywood, which has kept my back better than it, uh, you would expect, but not, uh, not in great shape anyway. And my favorite scroll saw, my Hegner. So this corner of the shop is where I predominantly do my sharpening and my drilling. My machinist tools are in here. I've got these tools laid out because I just got them last week. And so I just sharpened the chisels and, uh, and I cleaned up this, this beautiful little saw here that I got, um, uh, which is a Yates and wood. And um, so I just cleaned it up a little bit, got it in shape. I need, to, I need to really work on this chisel, but I showed you these things, I think, last week. Um, so down in here, which I don't know if you can really see, I put this out so I could show you. This is a weight off an old scale. I save weights. And down there's probably around three or 400 pounds of lead weights and scales. And anytime I see somebody throwing away a weight machine, I steal the weights off them, not the machine, because I don't want to exercise. <coughs> but they work great for gluing things down when you can't clamp them. So I just pile weights on them. And um, this is my buffing machine, um, my sharpening setup, and um, my wooden clamps down here, my miter uh, uh, vice down there. Um, 
if you have any questions later on details or something, we can go into that, but I don't want to bore you with the details right now. But so this is pretty much this bench I use for flat work and that I use for longer work because I have room in the shop to get a long board in there. Here I don't. And uh, this is an old, uh, I think it's Craftsman drill press that you put your electric drill in. I use it for my branding iron uh, because I used to hold my branding iron with a glove. It got so hot uh, when you're trying to hold it. And so a friend of mine's father passed away and he gave me this and it works perfectly for that. So, um, and all my uh, drill pieces, and these are all my machinist uh, uh, tools in here, more of the precision things, my drill press items and, uh, and my ancient drill press, but it keeps on running, so I'm not gonna get rid of it. So uh, we're gonna go in the tool shop now, but as we go in, you'll see I've got all my hammers here, all different sorts. I've got some real specialty hammers that I think are just crazy. I don't know if you have enough light to see that. It's got a little anvil, a puller, a wedge, and uh, it's got a hefty weight to it. And um, I think it's, it's homemade by either a pattern maker or a blacksmith. And um, so here are all my small clamps here and my plane blades. But we're gonna come on into the shop. So it might be a little shocking. Um, let's see if you can just give them sort of a wide shot while I close that door to the art room. And I think you can do this. Um, just sorry guys for the pause. Um, so we're gonna start over here. You'll pan back around. I hope you're not in shock yet at the hoarding. But, uh, so we're gonna just kind of work our way around the tool room and I'll tell you about things. And later, if there's something that you think uh, is interesting to you, we can pull it off and talk about it. I try to keep everything uh, by, by use, not by maker. So uh, I know Jim was thinking that I only collected Stanleys, but I really collect tools by use. Um, but I like to collect a variety of them because I, it's nice to see how one company made something and another company made the same piece, but maybe with a little difference to it. For instance, in these bevels, these are bevels that I don't particularly care for because this uh, wing nut is, gets in the way of the board. And um, so I prefer these, these versions or this thumb screw, but I just got this one, which I think is really nice with sort of a mushroom head. But there's no maker on it that I can tell. Beautiful rosewood and really nice brass work. And, uh, but uh, you notice the screws are not clocked. So um, I might not have, be able to keep it. But so here are my squares. Um, and then here are my uh, mar mortise gauges and marking gauges. And, um, and uh, we'll walk around this way a little bit and um, try to see if he can show you what's up here. Um, I store all my tool boxes, the, the boxes that tools came in up top here. I'm gonna grab a pointer real quick while he's on this so you can see. Um, and I store them up there because I like to see them, but, and I also know that if you save them, the value kind of sticks around for some of the planes. But, um, so up here you have, um, this is a, a for, uh, this is a plane, even though it looks like a, a, a Stanley uh, router, or scraper, it's actually for planing the leather bands uh, for, um, for running machinery to, to do a chamfer on it for like a lap joint on it, not a lap joint, um, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I'll be nervous throughout this thing and I'll get things wrong and you can correct me later. Um, th this one here I keep because uh, this is the one I use in the shop the most with a fence. This is a Siegley number seven type. And then these are my British planes, and there's my lovely catalog that Sarah sent me. Thank you, Sarah. So it's in front of a Spear plane. I only own two Spears planes. Um, I, I wish I had more because they're two of my favorites to use. They're beautiful to look at, but they're two of my favorites to use. And of course, the record. And then, um, and then uh, this is a, a, a Rumboldt's patent, but this is, I, I believe, a Lee Nielsen early um, it's for doing the, uh, the, the hinge uh, butt mortise. Um, and so you can take out a full shaving through that throat. Um, 
you just score the top and the bottom and then you just go up and it'll take out the whole piece. Um, so that one there. And then this one I just showed you earlier was the bird's eye maple plane that my father made for making oars. And, um, and then uh, I think you may have to go out a little bit just to be able to show it on this. Um, this was my father's uh, saw, and he always carved his name in, the, in all of his tools because he worked as a pattern maker in a, in a shop, and I guess he lost a lot of his tools. So it says spear here, and his little toolboxes, he carved his initials on. He must have gotten a good deal on bird's eye maple because all of his toolboxes are bird's eye maple. And I use these for, these, uh, for the bits um, for my, uh, for my uh, screwdrivers, which we'll see in a little bit. And then this was a box that he made for uh, one of his, uh, for his sergeant combination plane. And um, you see he has little holders here for all the, all of the, the blades or irons and the uh, arms. I have the plane out of the box because I have it up on the display with all of my combination planes. As I said, I like doing that sort of comparison thing. So, um, so let's continue on. Let's, uh, can you get this in? Is that visible? Uh, I laid out some things that I made uh, kind of to show you, uh, again, that familial background. All of these martini glasses and the oval tray and these little uh, pieces here were done by my grandmother's brother on my mother's side. He was born around 1879 and he had a factory in South America and he made these and then these I made a couple of years ago. They're a little smaller so you get less drunk but they'll suffice. And then my father um, did this for a movie called uh, Marie with Sissy Spacek and she, there was a, a Supreme Court portion in there and um, where they needed a big balustrade so what this is, is this is a pattern. And so you can cast them and they cast them in fiberglass. He carved this one and then they made 150 of them to do the whole railing and everything. So uh, that's some of his work as well. With six kids, he had made this chess set in teak and um, I think the other one, the other's uh, rosewood. And, um, and so that was the dark, these were the white, and we split it up amongst the six kids, so this is all I have of that chess set, but it's uh, still something my father made. And this horrible tray here, um, I made when I was about eight, and it was the first uh, thing that I ever did on a table saw with my father's supervision. It's, it's plywood, stained mahogany, and um, some some lighter mahogany or banac here, and it's uh, it was a school project, and um, and I, I nobody ever threw away anything in my house, so I still have it. And then these are all assorted pieces that I've done over the years, different spoons, carvings. Uh, a friend of mine had a couch, and she wanted it shorter, so I took off all the legs and I cut them down, and I had a big pile of these really nice blonde wood. I don't know what it is. Um, almost like holly and so I had around 14 of these so I made all my friends toothpick holders and then uh, I broke a glass and um, you can see the broken glass and um, so I made a new stem for it um, because we don't throw away anything. This was a piece of firewood I took out of a friend's uh, barbecue and uh, this will be an urn used for an urn later at any rate so this is some of the work I just laid out for you. And let's get back to the tools. Um, so, so I think I told you about all of these. Up here, these are all my block planes. Um, and, and this is the only one that I really use, which is a 60 and a half low angle with an adjustable throat. And it's one of my favorite block planes. And I used to carry it in my pouch um, on any job site. And again, my father, um, uh, put his initials on it, it was his. And what I discovered about it, look how tight that little that mouth is. Um, it has an adjustable throat, but on the side of it, I discovered when I cleaned it up after he passed away and I got it, it says imperfect, number 60 and a half. And the funny thing is it's the best 
plane, you can see how low an angle that is. But um, trimming a little door, end grain, anything, it, uh, it has no trouble with that sort of thing. Um, as I said, one of my favorites. Let's see if I can get it back up here without too much work. And then these are 95s on here and then 278s. So the 95s are a Stanley plane that's used for uh, uh, edging a board, for jointing basically, but it's always a right angle. You have a place to screw a fence on if you want it to, but a three quarter board fits perfectly in there. And again, it's a handy one for if you're on a job site and you want to do a square edge on something, you can pull this out of your toolbox and it, it, it uh, really works really well. I think it's one of their best designs. The 278 is interesting because it's a rabbit philister, but it's also a, uh, a chisel plane because, um, I'll explain these tags afterwards, because it comes apart here and you can take the whole front nosing off and um, it has the fence of a philister. It has a, a, a nicker um, for doing cross cut work on both sides. And, uh, but you can take all of this off and that puts the blade at the very front like a chisel plane, not a just a bull nose. So another handy one for your uh, toolbox if you, if you go on site jobs. So the tags are not price tags. They're because my memory is slipping. And so when I get a plane and I type it and I, uh, so I know what year it is, I can write it on there and that way, and I know who I got it from. And so I don't have to remember it because that's what happens when you get older. Um, at least that's what I remember happening. So you can see I like measuring devices. I've, uh, I've covered my walls in yardsticks of different companies. This one here belonged to a blind upholsterer and uh, my neighbor gave it to me, it was her uncle. And it has little notches along here so he could feel inch marks and then sixth inch marks notched up here. Um, I don't, I don't know that he's totally blind. Otherwise, I can't imagine the patterns working on the chair um, or, or couch. So those are those. And then up here are all the iron uh, uh, rabbit planes along here, except this one. This one is for a, uh, a click machine, and it's a, it's a uh, used for uh, flattening. Well, you don't call it a butcher block because it's not. They're not butchering anything, but uh, a, a click press basically is, has a cutter, a die cutter that comes down and cuts out either a shoe bottom or something, anything that they want to, a repeating pattern, but it comes down into end grain of wood. And uh, so that, that clicker, that, that plate that comes down and cuts, eventually will wear a spot in the butcher block, for lack of a better word. And this plane here, you can see has two, uh, a right angle cutter, and it's held in with a wedge. And what it does is it cuts along this edge and the bottom edge. So if you start along the butcher block like this, it's gonna create a flat line lower. And as you progress forward, it will flatten the entire butcher block to the surface depth that you uh, prescribe there. Um, not a very useful tool these days for me, but um, still an interesting one. And then uh, these are all the iron rabbit planes that I talked about. And below that, these are all core box planes. So I think if you move further back, well, does that help them see it? Um, so these are all different types of core box planes. They all do the same job, but they'll do different size coves. Um, and the thing that got me interested in them was the geometry of a simple core box. It cuts on one side and not the other. And what you do is when you define the width of the cove that you want, and I did a video on YouTube about this, so you could watch that if you want to, but basically as you go, no matter what, that point in the center follows a perfect semicircle. And um, I found that fascinating from a geometric standpoint that these people realized it so far back. And then of course they, they came up with improvements like this one here that when you pull this armature back, it takes this gear and it advances a cutter that's going around this way. So it's creating the same thing that this does, 
but through a different process. This one here, every time you push this button, it advances the cutter. And then back there is the Stanley version, which is just the biggest one that they made. Most pattern makers, and you can see these wooden ones in here, uh, made their own core box planes because uh, a lot of them couldn't necessarily afford the ones that you buy factory made. Um, and then you can see along this shelf as we go along, you'll keep seeing these trammel points uh, all the way down. You don't have to see them now, but uh, I'm going to get to these smaller planes. But you'll see those, and, and that's uh, just, I only use these two here, um, but I just think they're beautiful, so I start collecting them. Um, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, so here's all my smaller planes um, I keep in one area, all my little hundreds and 101 squirrel tail um, round bottom both ways. Um, like we're talking about the ore planes, but this is for the uh, for uh, luthiers, violin making and guitar making. Then the number one copies by Lee Nielsen and Wood River. Um, and then you'll uh, you'll see up here um, my favorite little rabbit plane, which was done by Paul Hamler, and um, uh, it's a tiny little rabbit plane, but it has the blade comes through there, and there's the little wedge. And um, he made a few of these. This is not the smallest one that he made, um, but it's certainly the cutest. Um, and then uh, I'm just going over here for a second, so for a reference. Um, I, believe, I believe this one here, um, I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe this is, a, is a Zephyr's um, beautiful plane. I would like to have a Bill Carter. I, I don't know if he's watching. Actually, I know he's watching. But uh, I would like to have a Bill Carter, but um, uh, I'd have to give up my retirement pension. But um, I got this uh, at Richard's uh, a charity auction, and I was so thrilled to get it. And uh, it's now become my favorite in the shop when I'm doing little chamfering or small work or uh, um, end grain small work. Um, it's one of my favorites. So um, if you want to move back a little, I think. Um, all my wooden planes are up here, and I don't have as many as Jim. I would like to have a little set for doing moldings, but um, this is all I really have. And then this starts my uh, combination plane collection. This is a beautiful plane. It's a lightweight aluminum plane by Lewin, a uh, British-made universal plane. And what's fascinating about it to me are, are, are these little... Uh, tightening rods. They're very fragile, unfortunately. If I were to really torque that, that little piece would break off. But it works on a cam system to uh, lock in the armatures of the, of the plane. And then over here is the Siegley uh, version of the combination plane. And then this is an Otis Fails uh, version, which I like a lot because it's so different than all the others. What he did was Rather than you adjusting uh, the guides and the blades, uh, each one, each one for depending on what you want to cut at the bottom, has a different front piece, blade, and back piece. So you actually are changing out the entire skate. So this is a little bead here. Um, and, um, and so there's around 20 or 30 of these different ones that you change out completely. Um, and then going across, um, or is a sergeant up there and um, this is a sergeant and a paragon and uh, another version of the sergeant that changed and I believe there's an earlier one that I don't have and then this is a reproduction uh, by Paul Hamler same person who made the rabbit plane of a very rare and very beautiful Stanley uh, I think it's a 42, but it's a combination plane. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, it was so rare and so expensive to have that he copied it. And it's really one of the most beautiful planes I think ever made. Um, beautiful rosewood knob here for adjusting in and out on the fence. A clamping system for the blade that you flip this up and it releases this front portion. And then a little, uh, a, a little screw here that you can move in or out. And that is for your depth of the, uh, of the cutter. And even, even the depth stop has a beautiful little finial with a little groove right there. So um, anyway, that's 
uh, I I also couldn't afford the original, so so there sits Paul Handler's reproduction. Um, and then I don't know if you noticed this here. And Jeffrey, you're going to have to tell me when I'm running out of time, but this is a clicker machine, an early one, and it was used for making shoe lasts. And what you would do is you would put a cutter, a die cutter, up here. You would raise this up all the way to here, and then you would put your die cutter and stack your leather, and then you would crank this down to cut. And when we were children, this is what we used for our etching presses, for doing our etchings and, uh, so, and any uh, intaglio printing. And so I, my sister got the proof press, I got this one, and I use it for veneer. So it worked great as a veneer press. This little table here, I made when I was seven. It was the first piece of furniture I ever made, and it's oak. And I made it, I found an old ice chest on the roads, of, on the streets of New York that was being thrown away, and I carried it home. And this was uh, one of the sides of it, and this was another part of it. And it was all done with hand tools. And it was when I was learning how to use hand tools and bench uh, hooks and all of that. And I made it for my mother when I was seven as a Mother's Day present. And then later it was used as a dart board. And I think the dart uh, thing is still on the bottom of it. And then you can see in here, this is more of my ruler ad addiction. These are some of my uh, favorites. These are engineer rules. You can see that they're beveled in the inside. One was my grandfather's and one I'd gotten later. And, uh, and that was so when you transferred a measurement from this line down to your paper, the measurement was closer to your paper. So it was more accurate. If you just drew a line off one of these and went down, you could vary and make an error. So these are engineers or architects rules. And then um, this is a really nice German silver one that's a protractor and a ruler and a caliper. And, um, and then this is an ivory one. It's the only one that I have. And then down here, these were made for blacksmiths because uh, they were going through too many wooden rulers sitting too close to the fire. Um, so, uh, so these were made out of iron. And you have your typical zigzag rules that everybody kind of knows about, which uh, pivots out like that. And, um, and then there's some interesting ones like this that um, what that what this one does is it extends out this way. For doing inside dimensions mostly. Um, so back here you can see these are my spoke shaves and my draw knives and then more of the spoke shaves go throughout here. I'm going to switch places with Ryan so that he can sort of show you this whole wall. Um, down here, and you can see that I've labeled all these shelves, and that's due to COVID boredom. Uh, I, I didn't have those up there before this, so there's the benefit of this pandemic. But so it starts with the number 41 uh, Stanley, um, and, and the nice thing about the number one Stanley is that it's a philister plane. So I don't know if you can see this here, there's a philister bed, and the fence is notched around it. And so um, the filister bed can be taken off if you want. And so you just want to use it as a regular plow plane. Um, and uh, it, I think it's one of the most beautiful ones that they made as well. And then there are little attachments that you can make, have for those for hollows and rounds that attach on the arms. And um, in addition, and all of the ones that are Japaned are the earlier ones. So a type three, number 41, type three, number 43. The 43 from the 41, there's no filister bed. It's basically the same plane, but there's no filister bed. Um, and then the type five, 43, and the type six A, 43, there are little changes in the screws and the depth stops and things like that. Not, the changes aren't really that big. And then you get into the 45s, which everybody knows about, the type 1, type 2, uh, and then they start changing the uh, getting away from the Japaning. And, um, and, then, uh, and then over here, still 45s, they get into the uh, nickel plating and, uh, and another modification. Uh, so, so I've numbered them all according to type. And then it goes to 46, which is the same as the 45, but the blades are skewed. So, um, so they're on an angle in there, and uh, so these are better for doing a cross-cut work. 
uh, across the grain work, 46s, and then the 47s, they just, it's sort of ridiculous because it's still skewed, and the only difference is that they cut off the depth stop, and uh, they didn't produce them very long. And then the 141 is like that earlier one um, with a filister bed, um, and the 40, 143 is the same, no filister bed, but this bullnose, this little front piece comes off. So um, this piece here can come off and you can change it and use it as a bullnose with the blade further forward. Um, so I know I'm going through here kind of fast. This is the 55, which is the monster of all the Stanleys. And it, um, it had 55 blades. And it, it's very complex and very difficult to set up for, uh, for your work. But basically, you have all of these towers and depth gauges, and these pivot. So if you're doing a crown molding that's complicated, you can change it out and, um, and be able to ride on work that you've already cut. Uh, whereas the 45s aren't able to do that so much because if you're doing a 12 inch crown, this is able to ride on the next piece by doing all these adjustments. And um, so it's, it's complicated. Uh, I've only used it once or twice. And back here is the, the box for all the cutters. Um, let me jump down here for a second while we're here. This is my toolbox. Um, I want to show you first. I was talking about the family. This is the, the, my father's side of the family. This is my grandfather's brother who was born in 1888. And he did these bookends he made. He made all of the furniture in his house. He was a famous archeologist and his son taught James Price, if you know him from other uh, sites. Um, but uh, but uh, he gave me these uh, years ago and I treasure them. But this is an old dentist cabinet. Oh, this is my grandfather's chains from when he was a, a, a surveyor. And their father, this was their, uh, his uh, uh, brace. And unfortunately, this is lignum vitae, but I don't have the pad that goes here. And I need to find somebody who can do threading and make me that uh, head for it. Otherwise, it sits there as just a reminder of him. So this is my toolbox. It's a dental cabinet and it has metal drawers. And this is, um, those are saw blades, punches, um, some chisels, crook chisels and things. Now, don't get mad at me because I know some of you would never keep their chisels like this. But if I were to display all my chisels, I would need another house. So here are some of my uh, in canal and out canal and uh, 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 carving chisels. And the, the big difference in some of them is the, uh, is the handle. This is one of my father's handles, and this is mine. Mine are all teak. And I did that just so that the next generation of family will know which is which. So more chisels, all of my smaller chisels. And then over here are all my rifflers, scrapers, my rasps, my needle files, um, fine things as opposed to the large rasps. Um, this is a beauty. This, this is um, some really dark Alvergia. It's one of my favorites. And it's, it's, uh, it's very sharp. I use it a lot, so I keep it sharp. Um, it's an Addis. Um, he used to be an Addis. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, so this uh, you know, holds everything, everything that you can imagine. And the nice thing is it, it takes a lot of weight. Um, so up here real quick is um, uh, back here is a tongue and groove plane by Stanley, which is a, a really neat invention because it used to be that you had match planes, which was two planes for uh, the tongue and groove. This one here, if you have this fence over on this side, you have two cutters and it produces the groove. But if you uh, change this out and spin it around, it's wider on one side. Now it comes over and it, it hides the other cutter perfectly and it just cuts the groove. It only exposes one cutter. So um, I think this is a, a great one. There are, there are a couple of other designs where you did it one way and you did the other the other way, but I think this is really a good thing. I'm not going to put it up there now because that'll take up some of the time. That's, um, that's a really, really good, Chester. Um, obviously, you, you've got quite a bit more. I think what, what we maybe should do is if we stop now for a little bit and ask a few questions, 
and sure. then come back because um, I'm, I'm sure that maybe some of the people want to carry on and see your the, the, the rest of your, your planes across there plus your your uh, your Stanley's behind you and then obviously you've got the art room as well which is uh, quite quite impressive um, so I'm just conscious of time because obviously we, we're up to about uh, 45 minutes already oh my God. Um, okay so if we if we <laughs> if we do the same as normal, um, everybody. So if if you're new to here, um, what we do is we ask you to um, find the chat button. So down in the bottom of the screen, um, you've got the chat button there. You can click on the chat, and then the chat will appear. You can then put your name in the chat, and then we can ask questions. So um, what whilst people are preparing themselves, um, Chester, what an amazing collection! Um, it's absolutely. Um, you know, incredible, and, and and I can now really see and understand why when somebody talks about a different plane, you can go and actually put your hand on it, and you can explain the differences because you have most of them there. I think you um, you, you summed it up quite well when you went to the rulers. Okay, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know wanna, if I want to correct your English. A ruler, a ruler is somebody that rules the country. You know, a rule maybe, um, but uh, you know, you, you you announced it as. Uh, uh, your ruler addiction. Um, I think uh, we can safely say you have a tall addiction. Uh, and for me, when I'm looking at it, you, you make me feel so much better because, uh, you know, I've got a fraction of what you've got. And it means, and I thought I had a lot, and it means that I can still carry on and collect more and, and, and feel good about collecting more. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. So over to the questions. Um, what I'm going to do is, is, is unmute um, different people. I'm going to try and unmute different people. Um, and uh, the first question we've got coming up is, is Matthias. Uh, but just bear with me, Matthias, because I need to change the software across so that you can you can do it so allow participants so you, you can now unmute um yourself um matthias and uh, we look forward to your question yes hello um i wanted to ask well first of all i wanted to say just as jeffrey thank you very much it was a fascinating although much too brief tour of a fascinating collection so thank you very much for that the, I got curious in the beginning when you said that you were one of six siblings and you grew up in what was obviously a very creative family. Were you the only one to catch the bug as bad or, are, or were all your siblings similarly inclined as you saw? All of us, all of us are involved in the arts in some way. Um, my brother Steve took on the mechanic side, and he painted cars, and uh, and he uh, and he, he he did that. My twin sister Charlotte owns a printing company, so she continued with printing. My sister Glenna did, took on more of the fabrics and the sewing and uh, and that sort of craft. Mm -hmm. Although I have a sewing room uh, as well, but I I don't want to. Uh, it's not just hoarding. A lot of this stuff I use in movies, like for either costumes or for draperies, or um, you know, if there's a tool, a, a part where a guy is using the tools. So all of us kind of took on different aspects of my parents' personalities and interests, and um, and so I wasn't exclusive in that. But I'm the only one that went into the woodworking aspect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, okay, next, next up is Shrenik. Hi, Chester. Thank you Hi. very much for um, a brilliant tour of your workshop. I'm sure this, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest, seeing the rest as well. Um, so, actually, my first thing is even though you're presenting this week, you, managed, you still managed to ask the first question. You asked us all how we are. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got my name in sooner. <laughs> um, so you you've got into to tool collecting while woodworking as well but a lot of these a lot of the tool collecting did it stem from when you were much younger when did you start collecting all these tools how how long has it taken you to build up this collection well all my life because i started doing uh like i said i started doing this when i was six and uh, so I got my first handsaw, and you can see that mallet. I think my father made me when I was 12, and he made it for his hand. I couldn't use it for the first, uh, you know, five or six years that I had it. Um, but he always, because of six kids, and we were very poor, um, I know it doesn't sound that way, but we were, 
we all lived in my grandfather's house, um, which was a big house in New York. And we had the basement, which was all the shop space and the first floor. And my grandparents had the sec second and fourth floor, I guess, third, fourth floor. And, um, and so we weren't allowed up there. We all, eight of us lived on the, on the first floor. We, five of us slept in the library room and my parents slept in the living room on a pullout couch. But um, so I think that that has something to do with my hoarding aspect is that since we were so poor, we shared everything. And, um, and so I've gathered a lot, but, um, but it's always been with the purpose of being able to use it. I've always had to create something. I've never lived in a house that didn't even have, even if I had a closet with tools in it, I always had to have something that I could bring out and put my vice on the table and, and, and do some work. So it started, it started early, but this, what happened was after my father died, um, my father died, I inherited his shop. And I didn't really like history when I was younger, and I didn't really know much about the tools. And uh, I had a friend from a tool media club come over and look at the stuff I had, because half of the tools, I didn't know what they did. So when I sorted through my father's mess, I would take all the tools that I knew and I'd put it to one side and I had two drawer fulls of small tools that I had no idea what they were for. And, um, and as I met older people that, um, that had been either using the tools or working with them, they'd say, oh yeah, that's uh, for this or that's for that. And then I would take it out of those drawers and I would put it somewhere where I knew where it belonged. But, uh, and, but as I kept going through, I kept finding new tools that I didn't know. And then I started relating them to a historical time period, like antebellum, uh, you know, or if you look at some of those houses that they built with hand tools, they're much better built than the houses we do today with, with power tools, and, and they're more complex. And, and I thought, wow, if they taught that in school, I would have really enjoyed history. Instead, they taught it by years and what happened, as opposed to, um, the whole sociological aspect of it, which I think now has me captivated. I think that's really interesting, Chester, and I, and I hope that answered your question, Matthias. <coughs> Sorry, Trenick, um, because uh, you know, I, I, in my new college that we've created, we're, we're trying to get that practical element across. You know, the, the actual learning by doing, um, and it's really important. So uh, it, it, I'm glad that you hit on that because that's a, a real, a real thing for me there. Um, what's really interesting here is the, the the whole array of people we've we've got on again tonight. Um, you know, I'm looking. We've got lots of you from America. We've got Canada. Um, we've got Austria tonight. We've got Brazil tonight. Um, who's going to ask the next question? Um, we've also got Matthias, who asked a question just now, is from uh, Holland, I believe. Um, and, and of course, we've got uh, Bill from Leicester. So we've got, got to mention Leicester there. Um, so uh, it, it's such a, a, a wide amount of uh, you know place. You know, when I when I when I put on the uh, the, the bench talk um, advert, it says location, and I put the world on it, and and it really is the world. Look at you all; it's 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 fantastic. So uh, anyway, back over to uh, the questions. Um, uh, Thiago from Brazil. Hello, everyone, uh, and well, it's America too, right? Uh, but South America, so. Uh... <laughs> Uh, no, just a quick comment. Uh, thank you, Chester. Thank you very much for showing your collection and your shop. Uh, I was amazed by it, uh, I think, as everyone did. Um, uh, you, you show some uh, very interesting tools. Some of those uh, I, I didn't even know. So thanks for that. And uh, thank you especially for showing some of the things you made and your family made, but the things you made as a, as a kid. I, uh, I teach uh, woodworking at the American uh, school here in Sao Paulo. And, I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, some, sometimes something you make as a child can uh, uh, follow you along in, in life and you can uh, keep that and cherish it. So I, I hope my students uh, or some will do the same. And, uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, uh, besides the, the, the actual things, it, it's, it's so important to have that opportunity, you know, to. Uh, uh, meet people that work with tools, work with their hands, and, uh, and, and, and know how to make things and know how to express themselves creatively. So uh, it's, it's, it's nice to know that uh, you kept those, thing, those things and, and people can actually keep, keep that and keep the uh, other things you, you acquire when you, you have a chance to 
uh, work with your hands and 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 uh, and do art and and all that. So thank you very much. And uh, one one year a year ago, I was in Asheville. So too bad I, I didn't know you were there. I, I could have uh, seen your collection in person. But uh, well, hope hope that can uh, happen sometime. <laughs> I'll invite you all. Brilliant. Well, I, I think I think we'll all uh, we'll all be there if we if we if if we're ever in America and we're over there, if this COVID comes out of the way. Um, I've been corrected. Matthias is actually living in Belgium, um, and uh, but from Sweden. And uh, we also have uh, Paul from Finland here. So it's uh, you know it's getting more and more global as as we as we speak here. Um, we've got um, Nancy from America. Nancy Hiller. So Nancy, if I you have to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Did you hear me? We, yes. we, we can hear you, Nancy. You've got a question for, um, for Chester. Right. Um, well, this is sort of a big picture question. The, um, the shop building, um, it almost looks like a house. Um, what is the nature of that building and its history? Everything in, uh, is encased in a house. Um, oh, so live, it is a house. Yes, I live in a in a subdivision. It's a five thousand square foot house. The upstairs is um, is furnished a little less is a little lighter than the downstairs. The upstairs has uh, has a lot of the furniture that I made, and I couldn't move that down here. But I I did want to show you guys a Queen Anne table that I'd made. But um, maybe I'll you can see those on my YouTube channel with the, there's a video on things I've made. The, uh, the shop is a two and a half car garage on this side. The tool room is a middle room. And then my art room is off to the left. And the art room has drafting tables. And then past that is the sewing room and the library, which has the book collection. Wow. And um, I'm sorry, I missed the first few moments um, due to my technological ineptitude. But... Um, what is the story of, you have a number of paintings, portraits in there. Who did those? Um, some I did uh, of my nephew and the dog. And, uh, and then uh, my brother, when he was in junior high and high school, did some of self-portraits of him. I did the man I think you're looking at now. And um, there's portraits of my girlfriend in high school, and my father is the bald man, and my twin sister is the woman on the right under the clock. Nice. Then the, then the landscape with the water I did uh, two or three years ago. Um, and, uh, and so th these are the worst of the paintings, so I figured this is a good place to keep them. Ah, I think it looks great with the paintings. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. I, 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 I think that um, you know, I mean, I don't know if, if all of you know uh, Nancy. Na Nancy's probably one of the one of the most famous uh, female woodworkers in in the world. Um, she sees uh, on a lot of uh, uh, you know the articles that you would you would see in the magazine. So I'm I'm pretty sure you, you've all seen that. So um, I'm going to do a bit of a bullying session here. Um, thank you for joining us today, Nancy. But actually, Nancy. I'd love to know more about your kitchens and your new book that you're doing for Lost Art Press. And maybe next week you'd like to come and talk to us all about your, you and what you do and, and what's going on. Well, that's awfully kind of you. I, I, I certainly take issue with being characterized as famous in any way, shape or form. Uh, infamous maybe, but, um, yeah. Oh, I'd be delighted to talk about the new book. Uh, I was I was totally blown away when Chris Schwartz asked me to write a book for Lost Art Press. I I love their work. So yeah, brilliant, Definitely. brilliant. Well, Nancy, that that's fantastic, and 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 you you are well known because everybody here had that. They're going like this. They knew you, so it's great. So uh, you know, don't don't be shy on that one, um, Nancy. Um, We'll come back to you next week. Uh, this week's all about Chester. So, uh, Nancy, thank yeah. you very much. And we, we look forward to uh, hearing all about you and, and what you're doing next week. So thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. 
So, um, Chester, um, we, we've we've got lots more questions coming through, um, and we've got um, so we've got. Let's go for Jim. Jim Hendricks is next on the list. Hi, Chester. How are you? I'm fine. I was more nervous than anything, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you did you did brilliantly. You did brilliantly. It was uh, it was really good. I apologise profusely. I, if anybody was watching any of the screens, you probably saw me moving around taking my headphones off, trying to sort things out. Everything is covered in orange squash. Everything. <laughs> so, including my new headphones, which is really annoying. Um, anyway, one thing I, uh, if you put your right arm out and over to the dental um, cabinet and grab yeah. that brace. Yes. Uh, you see now, obviously, even though I was working, on cleaning up my workshop, I did notice exactly everything you said. So, um, if you if you felt like uh, dropping that over to England, I'll sort that out for you. Make your bun if you want. I would absolutely love it, and I can't think of anybody else that I would trust more with this. I can't Sincerely. promise it will work, but because they are bespoke, they are proprietary. Um, but I have thread chasers, etc. What I won't be able to do is make it in Rosewood for obvious reasons because it wouldn't be able to send it back. Maybe I should make it in Rosewood then. <laughs> then I'd have to keep it. But then you yeah, just more... cover it in tape and you spray paint it to look like orange paint and they'll never go under it to look at what it is. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Because that, I, I know you mentioned it a couple of times before. Um, but I, I hadn't realized the significance of it relative to the family, and it's quite an early one. So, um, yeah, more than happy to do that for you. That is all I wanted to add. Brilliant. Jim, Jim, that's so kind of you. It's brilliant. And, and I think that kind of sums up about this group that we're creating, um, you know, all out to help each other in, in sharing advice and sharing skills. So brilliant. That's exactly what we want to see here. Um, we've got, um, I'm just going to um, ask, um, uh, Raphael uh, has, has got his hand up. Um, uh, kind of, Raphael, did you want to ask a question? We, we, we can't hear your microphone, Raphael. That is a problem then. I am muted. No, no, we can hear you now. We can hear you now. Oh, okay. Hi, Chester. Great presentation. Hey, uh, I, I, had, I, I, I think I heard you mention in the beginning that you had a connection with uh, mahogany. And I was wondering if you have, you still use it for building or, or if you still have a source for it. I, most of the wood that I use in all of my work is left over from my father's uh, work, either in factories and shops. He bought the Cuban mahogany around 1952 to make a cabinet for a member of the family. And it was a big built-in system that he made. And, and they had a row. And so my father wound up keeping all the Cuban mahogany. And he made a, a, a I'm not sure what you call it, but it's, in, in New York, it's a synagogue, and it's where they keep the scrolls, and he made the whole altar in Cuban mahogany, and, um, and what I have is left over from the job of that, and it's probably about a 50 or 60 board feet of different varieties, but I have long 12-foot boards stashed in there, two foot and under stashed in the wood closet, and then four foot and under in this area over here. So I've been using, except when somebody specifies I want hickory for this or that, but on my own projects, I use the wood that I have. I haven't had to buy wood in, in my lifetime, except for, for when somebody's specific about another project. I'm lucky. They're very lucky. Any specific, any special project in, for it? Well, I did all of my bookcases in my office with Cuban mahogany, and unfortunately, I did it in built. I did a built-in system, and then I sold the house. And I pointed out to the people that bought it that if they ever painted that, uh, I would come and remove it and build them new bookcases. But it went with the house. But I still have some wood left. That's but I have no, I have no uh, projects specifically, and I don't look for projects. When I run out of things to do, then I'll just create something. I'll just go to the shop and I'll create something. 
I, but I, uh, like, I don't buy books on projects and things. Everything that I've made here has been an impromptu urge, um, unless I'm requested by somebody to build something specific for them. Brilliant. That Ho hopefully that's answered your question, Rafael. Uh, I'll, I'll lower your hand. Um, you've got it up there. Um, so uh, we've got one more question, and then uh, we'll, we'll end the questions there. Um, Rusty, where's Rusty? I'm back. Sorry, hey. I, have to, I was actually in my shop. I have a student. My PhD student is building a, a stool. So he's my sixth PhD student and my first chair making student. But I was in my shop on the phone and my phone died. So I had to run inside to get on the laptop. Um, Chester, thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to dispute a couple of things. Well, one thing that you said, one is that, that your, family, your memory is going. I don't think so, because I was there, what, like a month ago, and, and I believe I heard almost verbatim, this was the, ver the, the shorter version. We spent about two hours talking about tools, and it was, it was great fun. And I also want to thank you, because when I left, I left with a uh, brace, and that's my favorite brace now. All of my chair mortises are being drilled with that brace now. Oh, I'm this is definitely the, the shorter version of what's there. I don't believe you actually had time to talk about braces at all. No, but that's above me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. You can see them there, some of them. Yeah, there you go. Well, there you go. And well, I've already filled yeah, so in the whole where spot. Was. Yeah, I filled that in. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I think when, when COVID travel is resumed, we should all meet at your place and for the longer version, and, and I'll be the first one to buy the ticket to the museum. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, I'm just, I'm happy to say Simon's quickly snuck another question in. So Simon, if you wanted to ask your question. Sorry, I was just muted. Uh, I remembered where my bono plane was. Um, it's not really a question. It was just something we were talking about right at the beginning. I mean, that's, that's the bono plane. So it's, it's got a sole lengthwise like a compass plane but then looking at the front the so the transverse has also got a curve on it and uh, I know you were talking about this at the beginning nice thing about these planes is they actually bottom out once you once you once you've got the curve of, on the spoon of an oar so from from the shaft down to the to the side of the blade yeah that looks very similar and they, so I mean, you just, you can make them bigger or smaller and they sort of bottom out once you've got the right curve on, on the spoon of the oar. That's just what I wanted to put in. So I remembered where it was. Lovely, sorry, I've muted myself there. Um, brilliant, that's, um, that's uh, um, the questions for the moment. Um, so Ch Chester, what, what, an, what an amazing talk. Um, and, and like, like uh, Rusty said, you know, two hours, maybe we should do a part B of, of your, your, your um, workshops because uh, you know, in, in, the, in the testing run yesterday, we, 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 Derek and I got a glimpse of your art room um, and, and your, your corridor that you see behind you with all those wonderful planes there. So I think uh, maybe, maybe there's a part two um, later in the year, if, if, if you would be so kind. Absolutely. Brilliant. I'd like so to show you one other thing, if Ryan can go over here, just real quick. I'd want, I wanted to make sure I showed you guys this wall. Um, you see the wall of planes, but um, the, because I, I want you all to think, I, if I have a reciprocal screwdriver sitting somewhere that I don't like or I don't use, that uh, if you uh, copy my address onto a little box, you can send them to me because I'm trying to put the smaller ones down in here and I'd like to uh, complete this collection. And uh, it's interesting because I had a collection and when I moved, I had to sell it. Um, so I'm starting this again, but I wanted you to see, and this is my namesake um, up here. I know they're cigarettes, but um, at any rate, um, yeah, absolutely. Anytime you want. I, I, I love to share all of this, all of these things. Brilliant. So uh, Chester, um, on behalf of Bench Talk 101, I'd like to thank you very much for doing tonight's talk. Um, if everybody's got their glass, um, uh, raise a toast uh, to, to Chester and obviously to the bench. Chester and the bench. Cheers. Cheers. 
It's a high-tech conversation. And a low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.